When a group of teenagers who love to read about the paranormal decide to investigate a very dangerous haunting, they have no idea they're playing chicken with death itself. And then we travel to England to take a look at the story of a school teacher who has a toy pistol in his desk. He figured a student must have left it, and he was going to hold on to it until somebody asked for it back. Little did he know that this toy belonged to something from another world. Today on Dead Rabbit Radio. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. I'm your host, Jason Carpenter. I'm having a great day. I hope you guys are having a great day too. I hope you guys are having tons of fun doing whatever you're doing. Just a quick update. At the end of this week will be the end of new episodes. We will have new episodes coming out August 16th. So it's, so it's going to be about a month off. We may or may not have Dead Rabbit Radio Classics ready by the time I go. Because I'm taking a vacation. I'm actually not going to be around. So we w- we may or may not have Dead Rabbit Radio Classics. I'm hoping to get some. But if you've been listening to recent episodes, I do have the flu. I'm not feeling 100%. But I got a bunch of soup. And I'm going to eat that. And maybe that will make me feel better. Um, but we'll see. Obviously, it sounds like I don't have a lot of faith in the soup. And whenever I think about food, I get sick. This is a good segue. Someone who never makes me sick when I think about them. Walking into Dead Rabbit Command right now in a nurse outfit to nurse me back to health. Everyone give it up for a longtime Patreon supporter. Lansing Loki. Woohoo, yeah! (laughs) Hot soup, hot soup. Hot soup, bringing me in a nice bowl of chicken noodle. Lansing, you're going to be our captain, our pilot this episode. If you guys can't support the Patreon, I totally understand. I really, really do. Just help spread the word about Dead Rabbit Radio. That helps out so, so much. Tell your friends, tell your family, tell everyone you know. Dead Rabbit Radio is your favorite paranormal show. Lansing, let's go ahead and get this party started. First off, I'm going to take off. Well, I'm not going to take it off. <laughs> you can undress yourself. Lansing's going to take off the nurse outfit and dress up like a old-timey train engineer. I'm going to toss you a steam shovel, and we're going to board the Carpenter Caboose. Lansing, get ready to chug, chug, chug us all the way out of Dead Rabbit Command. We're headed straight to Missouri. Chugga, 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 Specifically, we're headed out to Poplar Bluff, Missouri. And that's interesting. We were just in Poplar Bluff not too long ago for that really weird story. I'll put it in the show notes about the... Woman who claims she's a police detective and a psychic, I guess? Or she's having some sort of psychotic break. It's so weird. And when I was looking at this, I was like, well, Poplar Bluff, Missouri seems to be popping up on the paranormal map lately. We rented a car from a local dealership because this story requires a car. I should have just taken the Jason Jalopy, but I felt like kicking back on a train. Because we actually are going to the train tracks. We go rent a car from Enterprise Rent-A-Car. We're driving through the area. And this is the where we got to go, if you're familiar with the area. And it, funny I say that. If you're familiar with the area, you know this story. Very popular story. We're driving down Wilcox Road, and about a quarter of a mile down, you'll see a fork in the road. Turn left. Eventually, the paved road turns to gravel after a few miles, but you just keep driving. So you get to the railroad crossing. You drive onto the tracks, and you stop your car. The story goes like this. Back in the 1900s, there was a horrific train crash here. Train derailment killed most of the people on the train. And obviously, you know, back in the early 1900s, everyone would hear it. I guess you'd probably hear it now, but nowadays you could be, like, watching television really, really loud. If you're watching television loud enough to not hear a train derail, yeah, um, you might want to turn it down. You might already be going deaf. But anyways, all the locals rushed out to the area, and when they got there, they saw the train off the tracks. They saw bodies everywhere. Some were still alive. Help me, help me. And they're like, we're, we're going to try, bro. We're going to try. And then other people were just like, eh. And they're like, okay, we'll spend a lot of time on you. The 10 other people over there are dead. Rescue crews, medics, everything, they're out here. And a bunch of people died. Most notably, they had two bizarre deaths out there. One of them was a decapitated man. Which that's not bizarre. I'm sure there's a lot of decapitations. It was a train derailment, but this man, they never found his head. They found the body and they go, where is this guy's head? 
Someone's like, I don't know. I don't know. I, there's a bunch of heads over here. They're trying to match them up. Nope. Nope. Next too big. Next too small. None of these heads match up. So they never found his head. I mean, it's likely that you, his head got cut off and then, you know, just got squished by 10 tons of metal. Like as it's rolling along the train track in front of the train. The mouth is like, no, <laughs> I mean, he's like, he's still open. Maybe he can be attached to his body. The train runs over. But people thought it was weird. They couldn't find this dude's head. Another bizarre incident at this derailment was there was a pregnant woman who died at the scene of the train crash, but her baby was missing. The baby in her womb was gone. That's a little more gruesome. <laughs> I'm going to limit the amount of jokes. Probably limit it to zero. The jokes about that. When they say the baby was missing from the womb, I don't know. Sorry, this is going to get disgusting for a second. I don't know if she was ripped open and the baby was gone. Or, because that would be like... <laughs> I know where it went. It went somewhere. It flew out of her body. Not like Superman. <laughs> it's not a hopeful ending. But if, imagine, like, that would be sad. They're both sad. But imagine that's sad versus they take the people back to the hospital and they're like, let's do, let's do autopsies and find out how these people died. Maybe one of them was murdered. Maybe one of them was poisoned. Candlestick wound to the back of the head. You probably don't do an autopsy at a mass casualty event. You're probably just like, I'm going to assume all of these people died in the airplane explosion because the plane exploded. But imagine the craziness if you were doing an autopsy on a, this pregnant lady pulled out of the train crash and you opened her up and the baby was missing from her womb. Like there was no external injuries. And the doctor's like, I wonder what killed this lady. And then they're like cutting her open. And then they're like, where's the baby? That would be weird. That would be super bizarre. That'd be more bizarre than everyone. <laughs> Jason, please stop talking about it. It's so disturbing. You're talking about it. Like, you talk about just a, a random ghost walking around a house and you're so matter-of-factual about it. If the baby flew out of an open womb, <laughs> okay, that would be that would be understandable. I don't think that would be paranormal. It's sad. It's sad, for sure. But I wouldn't go, hmm, what's the mystery here? The baby flew out of a pregnant woman at 90 miles an hour. But this was considered an odd paranormal event. So these days... This is a very famous ghost story in the Poplar Bluff area. You drive your car to the railroad tracks. You shut it off. And what happens is the windows will fog up super fast. Faster than normal. You know, normally you're sitting in a car, hanging out with your buddies, talking. The windows will fog up over a period of time. This, it happens almost immediately. And you're sitting in the car and the windows are all fogged up. And then you'll hear someone tapping on your window. Tap, tap, tapping, tap. And you have to wipe away the fog, wipe away the, the foggy windows. And you'll see a woman standing outside your car and she goes, Have you seen my baby? Have you seen my baby? Pretty creepy, right? And you're like, well, <laughs> did you get ripped open? Or did they do an autopsy on you? She's like, what? Do you know where my baby's at? She asks. And... If you get out of your car, which here's the thing, right? That's enough for me. That's enough for me. If I was like, oh, I wonder if this place is haunted. And out of nowhere, a pregnant phantom showed up and said that. I'd be like, I'm good. This is all the proof I need. But if you get out of your car, you will see a decapitated man in a ditch nearby searching for his head. Okay. Pretty terrifying things. I don't know why you would get out of your car. You're like, what? I have to pee now as the phantom lady's out there. Where's my baby? You're like, I have to go pee all of a sudden. Which I have made that connection in past episodes. There is a connection between having to urinate really, really bad and a paranormal event about to occur. But um, I've experienced that myself. But anyways, if you did get out of your car, whether you had to urinate or not, you'd see the man in the ditch looking for his head. Two pretty grisly phantoms in this area, this was posted on the Shadowlands.net, and the person who posted it said, I've seen this myself. Like, I've been here myself, and I've seen these phantoms. It's a creepy story for sure. It's also an incredibly dangerous story. Because you understand what you're asking someone to do is to stop their car on a railroad track. And this is an active 
train track. But it's not just dangerous in theory. On June 5th, 2012, there were these five girls. They really, really loved ghost hunting. They specifically loved this particular legend. They had been up here before. And store, there's different stories to this. We'll get into that at the ending. But what the authorities believe is that the girls parked their car on the railroad track, just like the legend says. And a train started barreling down the track towards them. Now, the authorities say they parked their car on the train track specifically to live out this ghost legend. One of the survivors, a girl named Casey Ogden, she goes, that's not true. We did go up there to investigate the ghost, but we parked next to the train track. And then when it was time for us to leave, we tried driving over the train track and the car died. But either way, the car was on the train track as this Amtrak passenger train is barreling down towards them. Three of the girls jumped out of the car, including the owner of the car, Haley Whitmer, a 17-year-old girl. Three of the girls jumped out and they start running, but two of the girls, Victoria Swanson, a 15-year-old, and Caitlin Fowler, a 15-year-old, they couldn't get their seatbelts off. Haley ran back to the car as this train wailing on its horn. There is no way this train can stop in time. They see this car on the tracks. Haley runs back to the car to help her two friends who are stuck. They can't get their seatbelts off. Haley runs over. She frees Caitlin. She then tries to undo Victoria's seatbelt. The train smashes into the car that is parked on the train track, instantly killing Haley and Victoria, Caitlin seriously injured in the impact. And they say we weren't actually on the train tracks. Authorities don't believe that. They believe that they actually were on the train tracks. And it's interesting because, you know, a lot of people knew of this legend before, but everyone in town knew it afterwards. And you had the Butler County Coroner, Jim Akers, Say, quote, what I was amazed at is this isn't only in Butler County, Poplar Bluff, but there are cities throughout the U.S. that had similar stories. There's a whole website for this. And I thought, I wonder if he means the Shadowlands.net. Because that is such a gateway to a lot of these ghost trips, right? You can go to, you can go to your... State, you can get down to your city. I mean, Shadowlands.net isn't the only ghost hunting site, but it's probably the the biggest one, the easiest to navigate for sure. There are other ones. The St. Louis Times, the newspaper, when they were talking about this, they mentioned a website called Strange USA. They linked to that, but that's now, you're not going to believe me when I tell you this, but now that's a website for elderly escort service. Not that... The escorts are elderly, but it's for old men to be like, I'm going to go to Vegas. I'm going to go to Vegas and I'm 78. And then I want to hire this hot 22 year old to have her arm draped around me. I mean, I guess, right? I mean, you're 78 years old. You don't have much to lose at that point. You're like, gonorrhea, here I come. But I just thought it was weird. It's like, oh, strange USA. Is that going to be a new paranormal Website? No. I mean, it's definitely weird. Definitely strange USA. They must have lost the name at some point and some... I don't know why you would combine those two. I don't know why you'd go, you know what? We uh, have a great idea. Elderly escort service. So we just need a name. (laughs) And someone goes, well, you know, this is a very strange business we're in. That's it, Timmy. Strange USA. Let's see if we can find that. I wonder if they mean the Shadowlands.net. I wonder if that's what the coroner was talking about. It's tragic. We've talked about this before. Ghost hunting. I've been on a lot of on-the-ground ghost hunts. It's not It's not safe. It's not safe. There is so much stuff you have to do. Basic just trespassing, right? You're often in a place you're not supposed to be late at night. I always recommend people to be sober, to have your license on you, to have your ID, because if the police stop you... Sometimes they can take you downtown just to figure out who you are. So you want to have all that stuff on you. You want to have cell phones on you and you want to be prepared to fight people, weirdos out in the woods. 
or wild animals as well. And that's the base level of safeness. Stopping a car in a train track, I would never have done that. And I'm not trying to ghost shame these girls or anything. I understand when you're younger, you do stuff that is far more riskier. But now again, Casey said we weren't on the train tracks. We were in the area. And as we were driving across the train tracks, the car died. That's what she was saying. That's definitely possible. That's definitely possible. But the risk factor goes way, way up. Like, I wouldn't go... I'll jump a fence. Well, I can't, I can't nowadays, but I used to be able to jump a fence to go into an old graveyard or a spooky church or whatever, someone's backyard. But I wouldn't hop a fence to, to be like, check out this haunted police station, right? Did you know this prison's haunted? It's haunted by several inmates that are still alive and want to kill you. You know, you do... There is that risk factor involved just with a normal ghost hunting. But yeah, on an active train track... It's terrifying. It really is. I I always recommend people ghost hunting. I think it's a fun pastime. At the very least, you're hanging out with your mates, having a blast. At the very most, you guys might experience something paranormal. But safety first. It's such a tragic story. And I know that good or bad taste, probably bad taste, now the local kids in that area must talk about those three girls, that their spirits are still trapped up there. I bet you if you go out after midnight and you park your car, you'll see three girls hugging each other, sobbing in the darkness. Like I'm, I'm sure that's become part of the legend, which is sad, right? It's totally tasteless, but that's how legends are born. That's how these legends are born. It's absolutely tragic story. And it all came out of a... I, I wasn't able to find any proof that a train actually derailed there. I mean, that's so vague, a train derailing in the 1900s. But the lack of proof makes me think that that story probably didn't happen either. Because that'd be pretty... That'd be in your newspaper. <laughs> that would definitely make the local news. Pregnant woman, baby, flung out of an open wound or disappeared? Question mark? That's a weird headline. But a tragic story, a story that probably started off as an urban legend became a real life tragedy and now that has probably just simply added to the haunting the story of the haunting at least i'm not saying the girls are actually trapped there i'm saying that that would now become part of the legend creepy creepy story be safe when you guys are doing this stuff 100 percent safety first been on a lot of these hunts and that was always my rule and I, you know people go you know you always say be sober when you do this but maybe if you were on like hallucinogens maybe be more open to seeing something. Sure, that might work. But you don't want to be tripping balls as you're trespassing in a place that you've never been before. That's the, the spiritual side of it, we can have that debate. But the reason why I say that is because it's already inherently dangerous to trespass late at night, a place you've never been. These girls had been up to this place a couple times, they said, already. But they still weren't oh they weren't taking in the full risk factor of it all. Absolute tragedy. And we just need that my wish for you guys is to be safe if you decide to do on the ground ghost sentence. Because it is really fun, but it is quite scary. Lansing, Loki, let's go ahead and toss you the keys to the carpenter copter. We are leaving behind Poplar Bluff, Missouri. Fly us all the way out. To jolly old England. <laughs> First off, I got to give a shout out to Sustained Disgust. Sustained Disgust is the architect behind the newest and, in my opinion, one of the most impressive conspiracy theory icebergs I've seen since the original set back in 2016, 2017. 400 entries of things that I've never even heard of. And I read this stuff every single day for years and years, really almost full time since I started this podcast five years ago. Sustained Disgust went out of their way to create this amazing iceberg with links, which is something that all new icebergs need. So we can research this. We can actually go in and see where they got this. And it's absolutely fascinating. It'll be in the show notes, of course. I imagine we'll be covering a lot of great topics from this. And this one is no exception. This is absolutely bizarre. We're in East Anglia, England. It's a few years before 1976. It's a weird way to date it, but it will kind of make sense. A few years before 1976, 
It's December. Is that a Christmas song, right? That's not the song from The Exorcist. We're walking into this elementary school. There's a small village school in East Anglia. And we're about to meet a teacher. He doesn't give his name. We're going to go ahead and call him Michael. Michael's teaching at this small village school. He had two curious things happen to him. First off, people go, hey, Michael, Michael, did you hear the news? Did you hear the news of what happened last night? And he's like, no, what is it? And they're like, ah, with his own peepers he saw, with his own peepers. Old man Johnson was out walking his dog last night. And an orange light appeared somewhere on the school field. Right out there, I think. Right out there. Now, dry British wit. It's never funny. I actually think it's the lowest form of humor. However, Michael does explain this part of the story. I had a slight guffaw at this. When Michael wrote this story down, he this was a letter to the editor published in the Guardian newspaper November 30th, 1976. It's very weird to see this this story printed in the newspaper. Michael wrote in his letter, he goes, quote, Cynics suggested he had seen more light ale than anything else. Okay, I mean, I gotta admit, I gotta admit, that's a little clever. You get one joke, Britain. That was it. Anyways, so he had heard this story about this light, this orange light being seen somewhere on the school field. Well, anyways... Later, either the next day or that same morning, it was kind of hard to differentiate in the article. But anyways, let's just say the next day, Michael is at school and a student comes up and goes, Mr. 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 Look what I found. Huh? What is this? And the little dude's holding out his little hands. And Michael looks down and the boy's holding what appears to be a small plastic toy pistol. And and Michael goes, interesting, that's not yours, Johnny? He goes, no, it's not good, sir, it's not. And Michael's like, well, I'll take it. Maybe a kid lost it, right? Maybe a kid lost it and he'll come looking for it. So Michael takes the toy pistol, puts it in his desk, and begins teaching his class. Pip, pip, everybody, in your seats. Today we're doing a bunch of Christmas stuff. And the kids are getting ready for Christmas festivities. And, you know... Michael's a little just, he's over it, right? Christmas vacation's coming up soon. He can't wait to leave. The the kids also know Christmas vacation is coming up soon. They can't wait to leave. They can't wait for Santa to bring them the presents. And they're also doing a pretty unstructured activity. So the excitability quotient is super high. These kids are hyper and they're working on this Christmas project and they can't wait for school to get out and Michael just can't wait to blow his brains out. He just wants us to end. Specifically, there's this girl named Sandra who just can't stop talking. He's losing it. She just keeps going on and on and on. And he's like, oh my God, Sandra, please just shut up. Just, just you, just you. If you just shut up, I can handle all the other noise going on in this classroom. You're driving me absolutely up the wall. Michael's a good teacher, though. He's not going to say that. He'll write, he'll write it in a letter to the editor years later, hoping that she doesn't read it. He's like, oh, Sandra was adult. She never learned how to read. She'll never read this article. He doesn't want to tell her that. He's being polite. But he's sitting there at his desk, and he's like, oh, my God, just shut up. Just shut up, Sandra. And a little devil probably appeared on his shoulder and goes, Michael, Michael, you got a little gun in your desk. <laughs> I mean, you know what's so funny nowadays? The story sounds far more sinister. You have a teacher with a toy gun in his desk at his school. Nowadays, if a kid walked up to his teacher and says, I found this, I found this toy gun on campus, they're locking down the entire place. Michael reaches into his desk and pulls out this small plastic toy pistol, and he discreetly pulls it out of the desk and aims it right at Sandra, puts his finger on the trigger and goes, gotcha. Click. A playful joke. Right? <laughs> a playful joke. Pointing a fake gun at a student. Pulling the trigger. <laughs> you can get away with that nowadays, I think. Or it's five years in prison. He points the toy gun at Sandra and he goes, gotcha. Click. Sandra disappears. 
Michael's sitting there and he has this toy gun kind of in his hand. And he's looking at where Sandra previously was. She's not there. He scans the room from side to side. The chaos of all these students running around, getting ready for these pre-Christmas festivities. She's nowhere to be seen. Sandra is gone. And a bunch of observations are going through his head at once. One, first off, a student completely vanished in front of me. Two, none of her classmates noticed. They just continued on with their activities as if she was never in the room in the first place. Now, Michael has no idea what to do, right? You have zero idea of how you're going to deal with this. They never trained you for this in teacher school. I'm sure they actually train you on what happens if a student disappears, but they don't mean magically. They mean if they get kidnapped, right? They don't mean... Say a student say a student dematerializes in front of you. Here's the 10 steps. And Michael just sits there and he's trying to figure out what to do. And it doesn't take long until class school is over and he dismisses all of the students. And he's hoping maybe that Sandra jumps up from behind a desk. Maybe it was a joke. Maybe she was in the closet. No, he's now just sitting in this room all alone. Having zero idea of how to deal with this situation. How do you even begin to explain that to anybody? And also knowing the explanation is, Sandra was annoying me so much, I pointed a toy gun at her. Like, that's how it has to start. And they're like, what? Why do you have a gun in your desk? And he's sitting there trying to figure out what to do. When suddenly he is aware that there is a man standing next to him. There is a man standing in the classroom wearing what was described as a, quote, boiler suit protective clothing. Which, you know, I know that boiler is a term for just like a standard form, like a boilerplate release form is just like a standard form. There's no specificity about it. I don't know if that's what he means because we're talking about England. I don't know if he means he was just wearing standard protection garb. Looks like someone who works at a factory. Or if it looked like this guy actually worked at a a boiling factory. I don't know. But he goes, I looked over and this guy was wearing this protective gear. I imagine it. it's like one. Because when I typed in boiler suit protective clothing, it was one of those suits that had like the canopy, the head, like the plastic visor. And basically they were wearing a suit you would imagine someone would wear. They were dealing with hazardous materials. No skin is exposed. It's puffy. And it has the visor, their head's completely enclosed. But he turns and he looks and there's a man standing right there wearing this boiler suit protective clothing. And at first, Michael thinks this guy is like a parent coming to pick up a kid. Maybe Sandra, right? Maybe this is Sandra's dad being like, "Uh, where's Sandra? How come uh, she didn't come outside? And the man standing there looks down at Michael and Michael looks up at him. And then the man is holding out Both hands. And the man is holding out one of his hands. And in that hand, he's holding the same type of toy pistol. And with no words said, Michael knew what this guy wanted. He wanted his toy pistol. He wanted to get the pistol from... Michael. So Michael opens up his desk and pulls the pistol out and he hands that toy pistol to the man in the suit, the man in the protective suit. And he goes, the man then took the pistol, kind of looked over it, turned a switch on the side, this little ratchet switch click. He then pointed the gun at the center of the room, pulled the trigger, Sandra reappeared but it wasn't even that as as weird as that is it wasn't that just sandra reappeared sandra reappeared mid-sentence she wasn't confused that she had disappeared it wasn't like she had gone to some void and she'd been lost in this realm of madness no 
she was still talking at the same excited pace that she had been when she disappeared. It was almost as if no time changed for her. In fact, she stood there, finished pretty much what she was saying earlier, that there's the reason why Michael shot her in the first place, turned, looked around the room, realized she was the only student in the class, had a puzzled look on her face that class was over? What? That seemed to go by really quickly. And she left the classroom. Then the stranger left the classroom as well, carrying both pistols, leaving Michael sitting there alone behind his desk, wondering what in the world just happened. Super bizarre story, right? I've never come across this before. He wrote, this was published, like I actually sustained disgust, had the link, I went, he got it from the 40 and Times, I think it was, I went and found the issue it was in, it was November 30th, issue of The Guardian, because here's the thing, like obviously I'm like, this story's absolutely insane, let's see how close we can get to this actual article. I took a screenshot of the digital version of the newspaper, it'll be in the show notes, showing the, because I was like, was this a joke, (laughs) was this like a joke page of The Guardian? All the other letters to the editor in this section are super boring stuff. Not magical, no aliens attacking. It's like, you know what? The province needs more elderberries this year. Where is the mayor on this? Just dumb stuff, right? And then this story, it's titled A Wiltshire Teacher. Because again, I'm thinking, was this in the fiction section of the newspaper? Like, who knows? No, this was published in the letters to the editor. November 30th, 1976, issue of The Guardian. And there's two ways to take this story. Three ways. One, you could say that the guy was making a joke. Right? It, was, it wasn't real. Then there's the version that it is real. And it opens up a whole lot of things that we know or think we know about what this would be considered to be alien technology. Right? We can kind of piece it together that the orange glow in the field was either a UFO or some sort of interdimensional technology being activated, something coming onto the school premises. And for whatever whatever series of events led to this, they left behind at least one gun. I think kind of the narrative we build in our head is Michael gets the gun from the student, he takes it back to his classroom, and there were people out there finding, <laughs> like, I don't know, wreckage of a UFO or whatever. The investigators had come out from the government wearing protective clothing because they don't want to be around this stuff. They don't know how dangerous it is. And what happened was somebody on the government side or some black box agency found one of the guns and knew something was missing and continued to investigate and trace the gun to Michael, maybe through some sort of energy signature or what. Realized that Michael had done something with the gun, probably from his state of mind, you know, probably looked really depressed and confused, reactivated the gun so Sandra could reappear. It's also possible that this man in the boiler suit was actually an alien, and that's how he knew where to find the gun. That's how he knew that Sandra was missing. There's all these different things we can look at it from a sci-fi angle, right? It's a paranormal story that's real. I think... Let's put our conspiracy caps on this to finish this up. I really like the story being a literal telling of the events. Guy finds a piece of alien technology, uses it. It causes someone not just to disappear, but for nobody to notice, which is another key component of alien tech. We have all these stories about people being abducted from their bedrooms and nobody ever walking into the bedroom and finding their daughter missing and freaking out and running around and then coming back in and the daughter's back. No, it's almost as if when some, when you're abducted, people don't even notice you're missing. Which is more terrifying. You know, the students, she disappeared and the students, they didn't even know that she was gone. Nobody asked about her. It was as if she didn't exist. It was as if the only person who knew that she once existed was the people with the guns. It's possible, which would be him and the stranger who came in in the suit. We don't know how great of an effect this is. Is it that just the students around her didn't notice that she had vanished? Because they were taught, it was a group. Everyone was just kind of talking and having fun. It wasn't like she was walking down a lonely hallway and disappeared. 
did it just affect the people in that room? Or is it possible that her parents instantly forgot she existed? Like, is this a key to let us give us a hint of what the Mandela effect truly could be? Like, these changes could be happening and most people would never notice them. Some people do, though. And is it because of their proximity to their event or them causing the event? But you know what's interesting about this story? It's published in a major newspaper, very openly in the letters to the editor column. I love a literal telling of this story, which is possible. It is also possible, though, that this is a coded message to somebody. This, And we've talked about this before on the show, but it's been a long time since we've thrown out this theory. I felt like I was using it too much for a while. I wonder if this was a code to somebody, a field operative. And basically, you would go to the newspaper and say, you're going to get this letter to the editor. It's going to say something really weird. Just publish it. And you talk to the editor-in-chief about that. You have people in every media organization that is tied to intelligence organizations. Every single one of them. Every single one of them. You're going to get a letter to the editor, publish it, don't edit it. Don't change a period. Don't fix a misspelling. Nothing. Okay. You're going to put it in the November 30th, 1976 issue of your newspaper. Okay. And you'll never bring it up again. You're not going to do follow-up if a, if a reader writes in. Because obviously, that story is super bizarre. You imagine people must have been asking about that. That would have been the talk of the town. Either one of two things. The teachers in East Anglia are idiots, and they think that this stuff is real. It's poppycock. Because even he says in his own narrative, well, you know, people thought that this man who saw the orange light just was drinking some light ale. Like, even he acknowledges the skepticism of the community, but then he writes this story. And it wouldn't be that hard to figure out exactly who this was. It's a small village in East Anglia. You would be able to narrow it down, like who the teachers were. He wrote it, that it was signed a Wiltshire teacher. So it wouldn't be that hard to dox this dude back in 1976. But this would be an easy way to send a code. This would be so easy to send a code. It's nonsensical enough that the average citizen would go, oh, that's poppycock. I, what in the world is that? It's curious enough that it would draw eyeballs to it. And if you told a field agent, if you told a field agent, hey, we're going to have a message in this issue of the newspaper. It's going to give you your next level of orders. And you wouldn't know as a field agent, is he talking about the elderberries? Is this going to be the elderberry mission I've been dying to have? This is why I got into the game. You would say it's going to be a weird article. Because any communication between you and the field agent de with too many details of the article, if that got intercepted, then the code's intercepted. You would have to set it up that a lot of people would ignore it. Some people would pay attention to it. Your agent would know to find it. And any sort of counter espionage, they could look at it and go, we think that's a code, but we don't know what it is. It doesn't make sense. The story does not make sense. In a paranormal world, it does. In a podcast where we talk about UFOs and cryptids and all that stuff, it's absolutely fascinating. I love a literal telling of it. But my gut tells me that this may be a code. But we don't know. I mean, again, who knows? The most rational explanation for it is it's a prank that someone wrote as a joke. But we that, that you could dismiss all of this stuff with that. We, as lovers of the paranormal, go, it's possibly true. But I also kind of like the theory that back on November 30th, someone had to pass a note to someone else and they used it. They used the guise of a bizarre sci-fi story to do it. What the mission was, what the communique actually meant, we don't know. But we do know they've used this stuff in the past. There's that very famous UFO alien story, Project Serpo, which I 100% believe was communication between two agencies because when they said when they gave the information to the publisher when they gave the information to the publisher they said don't fix any spelling errors don't change any punctuation you have to publish it exactly like it is and they did i think like the second article they had fixed some things in it for some grammatical errors and they were contacted again by the project serpo source there th this is the project serpo is a story about humans have been on alien starships 
It's a very famous UFO story. I'll see if I can put some stuff in the show notes. I think we've covered it briefly. But at one point, they did actually grammatically correct a lot of stuff. And they got a message back said, if you do that again, we're not sending you any more articles. I'm telling you right now, you publish it, every spelling error, every grammatical error. Keep it that way. And the only reason you would do that is if it was a key to a code. If it was like every 18th letter minus 5 is the letter you're going to put into this key code and then that's going to give you the number that then you decipher the actual word, that wouldn't work if you ran a spell check on it. It would actually throw the key completely off. So we do have times where I think we've done this before, but this is one of those fascinating stories. Whether it is a espionage code for spies in Britain back in 1976. It's still absolutely fascinating. If it's the story of an alien gun that was found on a schoolyard, that's also, I mean, technically more fascinating. A young man, a young teacher finds a gun and he gets so irritated by a student, he pulls the trigger. That's actually a really depressing story nowadays, but back then he simply made her vanish. And what's interesting about it is it lines up to other alien lore as the fact that you can be abducted in really broad daylight people get abducted down alleyways people get abducted from leaving their cars people will notice lost time but to them just minutes have passed and that was really what happened to sandra it was all in the power of this plastic toy gun this sci-fi technology that we most people believe doesn't even exist this technology that can rewarp reality at the flick of a switch Looks like a child's plaything. Absolutely fascinating story. Truly dangerous technology. Just laying around the schoolyard. Makes you wonder what other bizarre items could have been left behind. It makes you wonder what other bizarre items may have been left behind over decades upon decades of aliens visiting Earth. And what you may end up finding one day out on a walk. Truly an amazing mystery and an amazing paranormal world that we all live in and share with each other. And I love it. I love all of it. DeadRabbitRadio at gmail.com is going to be our email address. You can also hit us up at facebook.com slash DeadRabbitRadio. TikTok is at DeadRabbitRadio. Dead Rabbit Radio is the daily paranormal conspiracy and true crime podcast. You don't have to listen to it every day. I'm glad you listened to it today. Have a great one.